morning, everyone. My name is Mike Anderson. I'm, I'm an engineer with the city of Vancouver. Uh, and this is Mike Zip. So uh, we are Mike and Mike from A to Z, or A to Z, whichever country you're from. Um, and we're here to present uh, on the development of the city of Vancouver's uh, design guidelines for all ages and abilities cycling. Uh, and I have to say up front that they are not uh, official, they're not adopted yet, uh, but uh, we have sort of been going, given the go-ahead to share them with you. Uh, and they aren't actually finished yet, and they never really will be finished. So uh, we're sharing what we have so far, and uh, we'll go back and forth a little bit, but uh, uh, bear with us for about 15 minutes, and then our Seattle friends will come up. So uh, I have to push the right button, apparently. There. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the policy behind uh, these guidelines and uh, then get into the, Mike more than I will get into the meat of the guidelines themselves and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about where our network currently stands in terms of uh, what we consider all ages and abilities cycling. So in terms of the policy context, uh, we've been taking an approach to all ages and abilities cycling since uh, around 2009. Uh, when we started into protected bike lanes, but uh, our, our city council really enshrined it in policy for us in 2012 when the uh, transportation plan there in the middle uh, was adopted by our city council. And uh, it's uh, really wide ranging why we're focusing on walking and cycling. For those of you who have, have seen the city, we're, we're built out so we don't have any more space for uh, road expansion. Uh, we can't afford it, quite honestly. Uh, but uh, as we've been talking about this week, uh, it's, it's about health of our citizens. It's about equity and providing affordable and uh, equitable options for transportation uh, where we you know, have previously been focused on the car. It's also about providing mobility and, and the options again for mobility and uh, making, uh, making life a little bit more affordable um, in many of the big cities in North America, as you know, uh, real estate is, is, has become incredibly expensive, including here, and uh, a lot of people are being priced out of the city. And so, uh, as Charles Montgomery said yesterday, uh, he showed a slide of, of the combination of, of uh, housing and transportation costs, and uh, whatever we can do to reduce transportation costs for people, we, make, we may make housing a little bit more affordable. So that's where we're starting from. Uh, I do want to uh, note that we do have a policy for walking of, uh, for all ages and abilities, but uh, we are focusing right now these design guidelines, design guidelines on the cycling side of things. Uh, we in, in Vancouver have a quite robust walking network. We, do, we are doing quite well in terms of quality of facilities, so, uh, but we were lacking the, the guidelines for cycling and uh, enabling people of all ages and abilities to cycle. I would say that, uh, as it says on the slide, these are aspirational guidelines. You know, we're not going to be able to meet them all the time, everywhere, uh, but we're working towards them as an aspiration. The other thing it, that I mentioned at the beginning is that they're living guidelines. Uh, not a lot of cities have gotten into this uh, in terms of sort of defining what means all ages and abilities. And so uh, we're going to be learning from each other at conferences like this and uh, hopefully through you know, study tours and things like that, where we can share our, our learning and our knowledge uh, on how we, how we accommodate people of all ages and abilities. So most of you have seen this, I won't dwell on it, but uh, Roger Geller uh, I can't, came up with the quote as far as I recall, um, and uh, Portland did some, he did some early research on uh, the segments of, cycling, of the cycling popula population. Well, we, uh, we would trot out those numbers here, but uh, people would say, well, what are the Vancouver numbers? Well, it turns out that they're quite similar to what Portland was using. Um, about 25% of uh, people report themselves as what they call regular cyclists. So uh, that, that's a survey that TransLink, our regional transportation authority did, but uh, regular cyclists are people that ride, uh, I can't even remember the stat, but it's sort of every, once, every week or every month, I can't remember. Uh, but there is a, about 40% of the population that's interested in cycling more, but, but concerned primarily about safety. Uh, and then a third is uh, not interested in cycling. So, 
that's fine, uh, but we're targeting the 40% that are interested, but are concerned mostly about safety. <clears throat> now, cycling facilities, as you know, and, and our, our uh, supervisor, Dale, talked about yesterday, uh, cycling facilities come on a spectrum. And uh, in Vancouver, we have all of these. These are all from Vancouver. We have shared lane facilities uh, all the way up to Off Street Path, the seawall, which is on the far right. And uh, so we see it as a spectrum of comfort, um, and it's not uh, not always linear like that. Some of them, you know, some buffered bike lanes are more comfortable than others, depending on whether there's any sort of physical separation. But uh, in general, what we consider to be AAA is uh, is the uh, the three on the right. So, and the and these are uh, confirmed in surveys of the population who are interested but concerned. Uh, they want to cycle on uh, well traffic calm local streets they can be mixed in traffic but there can't be much traffic on them we'll talk about that in a minute uh, they want to cycle on protected bike lanes on major streets or they want to cycle on uh, off street paths um, we have some off street paths but we don't have a lot uh, we don't have a lot of space for them uh, but so our our focus is on uh, the protected bike lanes and local streets or bike boulevards as they're often called in the u.s So I'll bear with me while I quickly explain this, but uh, um, what we find is where we do need to mix bikes and, uh, and traffic, mix bikes with, uh, with motor vehicle traffic, there are sort of a, there's sort of a, a range or a spectrum of, of speeds and volumes, and these are sort of the primary drivers we hear about when we talk to people who are interested in cycling. Uh, I'll go through it quickly, but um, generally we, on, and when we're mixed in traffic, we want to uh, be at lower speeds and lower volumes. We'll talk a bit more about that, but uh, in some cases where we have a street that's already low traffic or low uh, volume, low speed, uh, all, we can, all we really need to do is enhance the, uh, the arterial crossings and provide some signage, wayfinding, uh, and uh, generally it's okay. In the middle, we have this area where we may be able to traffic calm and move it down into the bottom left by uh, reducing the traffic and reducing the speeds. But there's a, there's a volume and, and speed at, at which uh, you can't really traffic home be, because there, there are spillover effects on other streets, and we've, we've had that experience here. And so uh, we have this area um, where higher volumes and speeds, can't, we, can't, we, can't, we can't get down to the lower left of the, of the chart, and so we are there uh, really forced into separating. So um, we've established a threshold for ourselves. Again, it's very aspirational. Uh, some people think we're crazy, but uh, on local streets, we're aiming for 500 vehicles or less. It's, a, it's an aspirational goal, uh, but uh, that's what we're hoping for uh, in daily traffic and less than uh, 50 per, in the peak hour. Vehicle speeds, we're hoping for uh, less than 30 kilometers an hour, 20 miles per hour in, uh, at the median, and we will, uh, you know, we recognize that we can't actually get all the traffic below 30. It's, it's almost impossible. So uh, we're looking for a 95th percentile below 40. I'm going to pass it over to Mike, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the other factors that we consider in AAA uh, assessments. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, as Mike said, uh, it's, it's a little bit more than... Uh, um, speeds and volumes alone. When you look at a local street, even at 500 vehicles per day, that's about 15 to peak hour, and you'll still be passing a vehicle every two blocks approximately into peak hour. Um, and some of our local streets are quite narrow, so uh, that interaction passing a vehicle can be, can be quite uncomfortable. Uh, so we did a little bit of analysis looking at uh, what it looks like on an eight and a half meter street, which is quite common in Vancouver. We have a lot of eight or eight and a half meter streets, 27 or 28 feet. And at that speed, if you, or that width, if you assume that a bicycle is, a, um, and a moving vehicle are equally spaced from each other, uh, you only get about 0.3 meters or one foot separation between moving objects, which is quite uncomfortable. Um, so to get that about three feet, which is kind of a common rule of thumb, you really need a, a 10 meter street uh, with parking on both sides. Uh, that's not very common in Vancouver, um, and we haven't really looked in depth of how we can achieve this. We may have to look at removing parking at some streets to achieve 
our AAA uh, aspirations, or even widening out parking pockets between the street, uh, street trees. Um, so a rule of thumb, again, 10, me 10 meters for parking on both sides, eight and a half meters of parking on one side. But it's a little bit more than that. Um, when we look at our streets, we want the wider streets for comfortable uh, passing as well as conversational cycling, as we call it. Uh, so you can ride side by side. Uh, however, narrow streets help calm speeds and they're good for a number of, of other things such as street trees and look and feel. So we really kind of have the balance street width considering the volumes of people biking, parking utilization, volumes of traffic, etc. Um, Moving on to off-street paths, similarly, we want to have a width comfortable to accommodate the full dynamic envelope of two cyclists passing. Um, so when we're looking at a bi-directional path, we're looking at around 10 meters, or sorry, 10, three, three meters or 10 feet. Um, for unidirectional, both where cyclists are going one direction, we recognize that uh, the, a cyclist can fit in this one meter envelope over here. So two meters could accommodate conversational pass or conversational cycling or passing. However, to get some comfortable passing, we want a little bit of shy distance. So about two and a half meters or eight feet, we recognize, we feel provides that um, comfortable passing opportunity. Uh, surface treatment, bumpy surfaces can be jarring to older people, can be difficult for newer riders. So recognizing that we're, we're aspiring towards smooth surface treatments preferably asphalt um, for cycling um, and uh, uh, concrete for walking. Um, although we do recognize special treatments will be needed in special areas. Uh, the debate versus, of shared versus separated paths, as you can see in this photo, um, urban paths get quite busy. They can be quite uncomfortable for people walking and for people cycling. Um, and we've received a number of uh, concerns about this. Um, so to, I guess, increase the comfort and safety for both modes, um, we're moving more towards a uh, separated model, um, recognizing that we don't always have the space for that. Um, so this is kind of our gold standard separated model, where um, basically we have a separate cycling facility, separate walking facility, a range of different treatments we would use. Here we have a two inch um, kind of uh, roll curb between the two facilities. Uh, grades, another consideration. At 3% grade, most people are comfortable riding for long distances. Um, this comes from research from Bello, Quebec, and um, others. Uh, 4 to 8%, uh, lots of people have to weave to maintain their balance, so these should be only acceptable for shorter distances. And above 8%, many people have to push their bikes, so we feel above 8%, it wouldn't be suitable for all ages and abilities. Lighting is another important factor. In order to have comfortable uh, everyday cycling on commuter routes, we need to pro provide an appropriate level of lighting, and we haven't determined exactly what that is, but there are some good lighting guidelines out there. And most importantly, intersections. Um, there's a range of treatments needed to deal with intersections. There's some good guidelines out there. Uh, Mass Dot has a good guideline. NACTO has some good stuff. Crow. Um, really about minimizing conflicts, increasing visibility. This intersection actually has all the conflicts signalized out. But uh, I guess a general rule of thumb, busy streets, greater than one lane per direction, we want to signalize crossing. If it's one lane per direction, we can consider signals or other treatments, such as median refuges, four-way stops. Um, and minor streets, we try and uh, give the right-of-way priority to cyclists. I'll pass it over to Mike and He'll talk a little bit more about how we're doing with our AAA network. Well, James is about to give me the hook, but um, 15 minutes goes by really quickly. Um, so those of you who have seen our map, uh, we have actually identified AAA routes, um, and uh, they're highlighted in gold. And um, But uh, we've an done some analysis, early analysis on our network, uh, and some of the areas outside the downtown also have segments of AAA, but we haven't highlighted them because we don't, you know, if, if they don't connect anything, we don't think we should uh, highlight them. So most of our AAA routes that are on the map uh, are shown uh, in the downtown area. Uh, and those were, were initially identified very subjectively, quite honestly. But we've done some analysis and uh, about a quarter of our network is already AAA. 
and we're aspiring to increase that rapidly. Uh, quickly, uh, just some indicators on how we're doing since we started doing this. Uh, um, cycling is the fastest growing uh, mode in the city in terms of trips. Uh, and we're also achieving some good safety results where the trip, uh, the uh, number of trips going up is, but the uh, collision rate is, is going down. Last slide, James has the hook on me. Um, as uh, you may have heard yesterday, but uh, the, uh, we have good results from the Comox Greenway in terms of, of public health. And uh, Dale showed yesterday that uh, we have a lot more women cycling on our separated network downtown. We're still doing analysis elsewhere on our routes. So we'll be back for questions after our Seattle friends uh, come up. So thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, Mike and Mike. That was fantastic. Is the technology work? Hi, uh, my name is Mark Ostro, and I'm with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and uh, I'm here together with my fellow advocates and our friends from the Seattle Department of Transportation uh, to talk a little bit about our experience evaluating neighborhood greenways in Seattle. Uh, so what is a neighborhood greenway? It's possible to define it in different ways. So this is how we define it uh, essentially in Seattle. That's a neighborhood street engineered to prioritize people on foot and on bikes. And we use a variety of different methods to accomplish that. Uh, speed bumps, traffic diverters, reduced speed limits, arterial crossing improvements, bike and pedestrian wayfinding, stop signs uh, favoring greenway, and a variety of others not mentioned on this slide. Why evaluate greenways? Well, obviously we want them to work, work better and we want more people to use them. Uh, we want it to look uh, less like this and more like this. So uh, we in uh, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways uh, sat down and thought about how we want to uh, evaluate greenways. And we went all the way back to the, to the beginning because uh, we're not all engineers. Some of us are, but not all of us. And uh, so we wanted to think about metrics in general. Uh, so we made this little diagram. It's your standard four quadrant diagram with a couple extra quadrants added. Um, we know that metrics can be objective or subjective, and they can be quantitative or qualitative. So we normally think of metrics that we use in traffic engineering as being very objective and very quantitative, but we wanted to be able to pull in other kinds of metrics and information. And then within each of these quadrants, you can actually have metrics that are uh, attributes of a greenway or outcomes of the greenway. And sometimes these are called leading indicators or trailing indicators. Uh, and we filled it in with a few, uh, not knowing which ones were gonna be relevant, um, and started our process. So uh, our first step was let's make a scorecard. Let's just lay out a bunch of metrics and go out and measure them uh, for a bunch of greenways. We only had a few at the time and lay them side by side and see how they compare. Uh, so we did that and this is great, uh, but it has a couple of, uh, of issues with it. Number one, these are metrics only for the greenway as a whole. And we know that the, a greenway can vary along its entire route. And again, we don't really know if these are the right metrics to be measuring. Uh, we haven't delved into that. So another experiment that we did was to make this uh, visual report card. And this was a lot of fun. Uh, this solves the problem of variability along the greenway uh, because we're able to identify issues uh, along its course. Um, and this, uh, this shows every stop sign, every speed hump, uh, every sharrow, every arterial crossing uh, with some other information overlaid. So that was a fun experiment and we got some use out of that, but still not quite what we were looking for. Uh, we kind of went back to a simpler approach. Um, this is an approach uh, that was made popular by uh, a founding father of a country down that way. 
Uh, ben Franklin, uh, when he was making decisions, he liked to lay out the pros and cons. So what I did uh, was I wrote every greenway that existed at the time, there were six, and just noted uh, my observations as I went. And this was great, except uh, this was just my opinion. And we really needed to think about the ultimate user of the greenway. Uh, so to talk about how we solve some of those issues, uh, let's bring up Bob. Hello, my name is Bob Edmiston, and I am a, I am a user experience engineer on staff with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And I was involved in some of these early metrics and stuff, and I have a background in product usability from the commercial world. So here, just because it's good to stretch your arms in the middle of a presentation, how many people here want some of their population to choose a trip with a bike over a trip with a car at least once a week? All right. <laughs> How many people are either advocating or designing or influencing engineering decisions for people that are going to bike in the future? All right. That's a lot of hands. I can also guarantee that between any two brains in this room, no two people are thinking of a cyclist with the same mental picture of who a cyclist is. So, because everybody in this room has a different mental picture of who they're designing for, the decisions that will be made by the individuals in this room will deliver a user experience of a cycling network that will prevent mass cycling in North America. <laughs> some, some years ago, um, I was in Oakland, California, and I was carjacked. The two people that carjacked me drove me around through, the, through Oakland in the middle of the night with a gun on my side deciding what to do with me. After that experience, there were certain places that I was not comfortable going. I would not go in places in sketchy cities that were dark and secluded, even places that seemingly would seem okay, I felt less comfortable um, going. Many people here and many people in your cities have something that happens to them also. They become parents. When that happens, these people make different decisions and have different values. So in our network, one thing that we did, because we, had, we have like 3,000 volunteers in 20 different groups, and we all need them to be pulling together in the same direction. So based on the work by Roger Geller from Portland and Dr. Jennifer Dill from Portland State University, we developed this Wendy persona to represent that interested but concerned segment. So Wendy is a fictitious person based on a large volume of real data. So Wendy, these are some things, these are some attributes about Wendy. And it's all based on real market research, real data, and if all of you, like all of us in the Greenways movement, have this person in mind, we can all independently make the right engineering and design decisions for this user. Meeting Wendy's needs is the key to mass cycling in North America. So we use Wendy as the lens to evaluate our network. So we know the things that Wendy needs because all this has been well-researched and each of these needs or values has engineering attributes attached to it in the neighborhood greenways. So with that lens, myself and three, Jordan, Stephen, and Jonica, um, evaluated our greenway network. We looked at every greenway from end to end that the city has ever built, and we collected a lot of observations at specific points where the designs might not be meeting Wendy's needs. So from that, when we combine that data of whether with the things that Wendy needs on each segment of the Greenway, uh, whether they're there or not, we're able to document that, as well as create a model uh, in partnership with SDOT for attaching speed and volume data to the same Greenway segments. And then we could look at segment by segment and say, is this G-rated? Can you turn your kids loose on it? Can they ride it to school? Will Wendy feel comfortable biking to the store on it? 
or going to work. Um, so with that, we can, segment, we can grade our Greenway network and know what to do to bring it up to today's standards. And our standards have evolved quite a bit over the last couple of years. You know, we found a lot of great things on the Greenways. SDOT has demonstrated how to do everything well that a Greenway needs, but we found a lot of opportunities in past Greenways that are opportunities to bring them all up to the same uh, to the same level. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Brian Dockerty. I'm with the Seattle Department of Transportation. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the Department of Transportation's approach to the evaluation. So I've been involved in the planning side of neighborhood greenways since the inception of the program, which was about five years ago. And um, from the beginning, we've gone out to the community and, and asked questions about where are you already walking and biking? What streets do you already prefer to walk and bike on? Where are the easy places to cross? Where do the signals already exist? Um, and some of the, from one of the um, recent projects that we just did, we learned some really interesting uh, data. We found that 88% of people are willing to go at least one block out of their way for a safer, calmer street. And we also found out that 83% 80, of people are willing to go at least one block out of their way to avoid a steep hill. And 45% of people are willing to go three blocks out of their way to avoid a steep hill. And Seattle, if you haven't been there, uh, is a city of steep hills everywhere. So <laughs> avoiding steep hills is, is a big, one of the big challenges for us. So we created a scorecard as well to evaluate our existing neighborhood greenways as well as to evaluate potential routes. And we look at the volume and speed of traffic, um, the ease of arterial crossings, are there signals, are there flashing beacons, are there push buttons to make the signals change, they're easy for bikes to use, are, is there access to destinations like schools? Um, and then we, we grade them with a sort of a green, yellow, red based on um, the variabilities and, and um, the preferred routes. And this has been covered a little bit already, but along the route, we changed the speed limit to 20 miles an hour universally without a, a traffic study. It's just neighborhood greenways have a speed limit of 20. We use wayfinding so that when the greenway does turn to avoid those steep routes or steep hills, that it's uh, intuitive. And we also do crossing improvements. So if there's not already a, a traffic signal, um, or flashing beacons, or if there, if there needs to be push buttons for bikes, we install those um, to make it easy to cross the busy streets. And so I'm gonna turn it over at this point to my colleague, Summer, who's on the engineering side of designing neighborhood greenways. Thanks, Brian. Um, as I said, my name's Summer Jawson, um, and I am a windy cyclist. I am somebody who primarily participated as a recreational cyclist before moving to the city of Seattle, an occasional bike to work month when I got to use separated bike trails and had uh, my last mile on, on calm streets where I had a prioritized crossing. And my first exposure to Seattle's neighborhood greenway network came in the form of a construction announcement. One was being installed a block away from the home that I had just purchased and we were really excited about it. We, <laughs> we got out and as soon as it was constructed, it became our primary route that we used for pushing our strollers and walking. We use it to go to the grocery store, the library, the parks, and as the network is building to connect to other neighborhood greenways. Um, I've been really excited to fill this role at SDOT because um, I see myself in the users that we're working for, and I see my kids in their ability to get to school and um, continue using this network and the community that it creates within my neighborhood, uh, the people that I meet when I am walking and biking along this route. Um, it's, it's a very slow route. We always run into friends as we bike along it. So <laughs> um, the evaluation that SDOT is conducting has been working very closely with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways um, using this segmented model. And the metrics that we're looking at here are, um, how have we done? Have we encouraged people to use this route when they 
find out about it like I did have are they selecting and is their preferred way to get around town and how are we impacting the vehicles that are using it um, as well so we've got a broad range of engineering tools um, that I'm sure you're all familiar with various kinds of data um, in this evaluation we're trying to look at what we have for before and after data so these are the methods that we're using so to look at two of our neighborhood greenways in Seattle that were um, built a while back, we installed permanent counters. And in Ballard, the neighborhood greenway that we built, we have before data from the very first week of April. And it's um, a challenging time of year in Seattle to be on a bike or walking, but yet we have seen that we've seen a steady increase in the number of people who are selecting that route to get around. We don't see a lot of variability in that route for days of the week um, as we look at the permanent counter. And Del Ridge is, um, is an exciting ride. It connects primarily to a downtown uh, commuting corridor. One of the things we heard on our survey was, um, thanks for validating my route. This is the route that I have always used to commute on and I'm glad to see that you have made that a neighborhood greenway. Um, we do have a permanent counter here, and in our uh, final evaluation, we'll be looking at if our 2016 numbers were down because it was a rainy week in May. Um, so we also wanna look at where we're installing um, costing improvements. For neighborhood greenways, the largest portion of our investment comes in these crossing improvements. And here on the University District Neighborhood Greenway, we installed a traffic signal in uh, December of 2014. And although we haven't yet been able to get a September count in this location, we have seen the number of people cycling using this uh, increase significantly. And um, this is a, a signal where there is no uh, bicycle push button, but we have uh, passive detection. So we also looked at the vehicle speeds as they travel across the neighborhood greenway and I'm highlighting here the University District Greenway again because this is a greenway where we were able to build uh, speed humps along the route only for a portion of the route and for the rest of this southern piece here in the University District core we were not able to install speed humps because primarily because of a bus route, although there are other factors as well. Um, what we are very pleased to see is the drop in the 85th percentile speed um, coming below our goal of 20 miles an hour. And the, more importantly, where we've installed speed humps, we see the drop in high-end speeders, which we are defining as over 30 miles an hour. Um, drop significantly on the Olympic Hills neighborhood greenway. We were even able to see um, where we had 5% in our before data, where we now have um, below 1% going over that 30 miles an hour. We also have a goal of selecting and prioritizing streets to get our vehicle volumes below 1,500 a day. As you can see in different parts of the city that is um, more easily attained than others. Um, our Jackson Place Neighborhood Greenway connects to the I-90 Lid Trail, which is a regional biking and walking trail for Seattle. And uh, right here, it connects into our downtown core. As the All Ages and Abilities Network continues to evolve in Seattle, there's a plan to install a diverter here with the protected bike lanes. We expect to see that go down. And I'll also go ahead and highlight this place uh, here on the University District where we're uh, very high. Uh, the time that we measured this, there is parallel construction on a major arterial street. Um, we're gonna come back and measure this when that construction is complete, and we believe that will be back down where we'd like to see it. So, like I said, we also conducted surveys along the route, and this included um, passing out surveys, intercept surveys to people who are walking and biking, as, long as, as well as mailing surveys to people who lived along the Greenway route. Did they know about it? Did they use it? What did they think of it? 
And the overwhelming response that we have gotten has been that people feel positively about the Greenway, that they would like us to build more of them, make them longer, help them connect to more destinations, build more arterial crossings, install more traffic calming. People are glad to see them and uh, we're really hopeful about um, how that influences and can build support for our All Ages and Ability Network in Seattle. <laughs> I'm gonna make this really quick so we can get to the Q&As because we keep getting notes here that we're over time. Um, but I'm, I'm Brie Geffbein, can't say my own name. I'm Brie Geinkeld with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And i um, just gonna kind of go over why this is actually so important because there's a lot of work that has gone in on both the parts of the advocacy group, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways and Seattle Department of Transportation to really develop an understanding of what our shared values are, who Wendy is, and what the criteria are that, um, that those values inform. Um, we use it at every stage of the process at this point. Um, the evaluation criteria we have go into the design and planning of future greenways, so we're choosing the right routes, and we're um, providing the correct mitigation at intersections and using what we've learned. Um, the greenway construction, uh, we actually learned that these values and criteria aren't just important on the planning end and on the evaluation end, but the people actually on the ground need to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, we had a series of speed humps that were at an inappropriate angle and were, we actually had people um, who were avoiding the greenway routes for biking because the speed humps were uncomfortable. Um, and Bob actually got us a chance to go out and meet with the construction workers and explain to them why the parabolic angle was so important. They went from resenting these people who showed up in the middle of the day to tell them how to do their job to, uh, to having pride of work. Once they understood the reason, they were very excited about getting it right and, um, and have since developed a template to ensure that the speed humps are appropriate on future greenways. Um, obviously, evaluation criteria is useful for evaluation. Um, it's also powerful when talking to policymakers. Greenways kind of started out as this sort of amorphous thing we were building, and it's really hard to explain why you need to fund them or why they're so expensive when they just sound like nice residential streets, right? Well, we already have nice residential streets. Why are you putting money into this? If you have shared values that you can communicate and articulate and the criteria that support those values and you understand what the budgeting is, it's easier to make the case. Um, and also, as Mike said at the beginning, Mike over there, um, talking about living guidelines, we don't, we don't have it right yet. We're still working on this. All around the world, people are working on this and we're learning from each other. Having shared values and an understanding of what our criteria are for Greenway construction now gives us a basis on which to analyze advances, new technology, new infrastructure, and decide whether they also work toward our values, whether they're appropriate for our city. You have to know where you are before you can figure out where you want to go. So, that's all. So, uh, we have officially six minutes for questions. So, the first question <laughs> should be really, really important. Uh, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and maybe hope that they might stay a little bit longer than the official time. So, maybe we'll have a little more than six minutes, but uh, make your question short, concise, and to the point. Uh, I have two questions that will try to be very concise. The first one is I don't think I missed with the neighborhood greenways. Uh, are you looking at connections to the actual greenways when you're talking about all these responsibilities? if I can ride this corridor, but if I can't access it, um, how is that influencing my ability to ride it? And then do you look at the types of trips that people are taking on them? Are they mostly, you know, are they commuters? Are they recreational? Survey that. So I'll speak to the SDOT part of that. And Bob has a lot to say as well, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So this is our, uh, our Greenway evaluation look that, um, that we have right now for SDOT. And this top intersection that we're highlighting is our opportunities for connection. Does it currently connect to another all ages and abilities route? Um, 
If so, great, it gets, gets a little green in there. If not, what opportunities are available? Um, I'll let Bob talk about how we're partnering on that a little bit more. But I, I'm gonna jump back over to this data. Um, in the interest of time, I cut a couple of slides here. And what we have seen where we've installed permanent counters is a lot of variability in how people are using the routes. This Delridge route is very exciting to me because we have seen that our before data on the weekend, on Saturdays and Sundays, we have about 30 people riding on this neighborhood greenway. And our weekday ridership, obviously much higher to get a seven day average of 70. What we've seen in the after condition, Saturday and Sunday is still 30 people. Only 30 people are on this greenway on Saturday and Sunday. Our weekday ridership has increased exponentially. And that's an incredibly exciting thing that we have been able to reach that Wendy user who is interested in commute cycling into work. This is a route that connects directly into our um, downtown network. So, do you want to talk? Sure. So in our modeling and for evaluation of neighborhood greenways, we have created an additional segment, which is from the end of the greenway to the next bicycle facility. And we evaluated those using the same criteria, looking at those facilities through Wendy's eyes to say, are they really good enough? Are they all ages and abilities? And I'm, right now they're really not too, just to be clear. When I said we're not there yet, we're not there yet. Mikey, didn't you have some slides about that? Yeah. Um, so we, we've, uh, with just developing these guidelines now, we are, we're looking at how we deal with locations where we're over the, the thresholds that Mike mentioned. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is, um, is uh, siding alternates uh, at, on our map and on the ground so that people who can't handle a, a short, even a short uh, sort of 8% grade, have an alternate. It's challenging in a hilly city. If I think Seattle is more hilly than, than Vancouver, steeper hills at least. So, but, uh, but that's certainly something we're looking at. Well, our preference is 3%, um, but we realize that's not achievable because there are hills and there's no way around the hills. So um, when we're, where we do have grades, we're targeting shorter distances, so 5% up to a few blocks, up to 500 meters, um, and 8% for no more than a block. Um, unfortunately, like for a street like Ontario, there is no real good alternative. There's a hill going up a hill, and no matter which street you take, there is, yeah. Uh, yeah, a signed alternate would definitely be longer, but uh, you know, it, it depends how far out of the way uh, it goes, but I think people seem willing to go out a little bit out of their way to, to go up a shallower hill. Uh, but you know, we have a ridge kind of in the middle of the city and all the streets go up the, the ridge, but yeah, you can kind of weave your way up. Delaware, you could spend your whole life looking for an 8% grade. It's like the Holy Grail. <laughs> so, uh, a question for Mike and Mike. In regards to the you know, evolution of the design guidelines for display facilities, intersections is you know, a huge one, and I'm wondering if you've kind of gotten into the conversation of different treatment relative to volumes from different options, but it turns into a really costly piece to fully signalize and everything else. So just, I don't know, commentary there. Yeah, intersections are uh, 
very context specific. So really you have to look at it all on a case by case basis, um, depending on what the turning vehicle volumes are. Um, uh, uh, for things like allowing permissive turns across a bikeway, uh, we look to guidance from Crow and some other European manuals. Um, we're landing somewhere around 150 vehicles per hour, or sorry, 150 vehicles turning. Um, yeah, I think per hour is the maximum for a permissive turn um, to be allowed. Um, for those who don't know, permissive turn is where you allow uh, right turns on uh, <clears throat> on the green phase across the the bike lane, um, and protected is where you have a separate signal phase. Um, so we're looking at that, but we're also looking at different characteristics. If there's a downhill heading to the intersection, higher speeds, we may want to look at different treatments. If it's a side street, you may want to look at raising the bikeway, um, but we haven't explored. It's very context specific. Yeah. Uh, officially, uh, the session has ended. Are you guys cool for a couple of more minutes? Yeah. Can we hang out? No, I don't I haven't seen anybody leave this room. <laughs> I was uh, sort of there from the beginning. Uh, this was not always a nice relationship. Um, so basically the Neighborhood Greenways group started because SDOT was not doing this. Um, and they put a lot of pressure on the department and then on elected officials to get us to, to change course. And it took, you know, it's a big ship. It takes a little while to change course. And um, I'm really happy that we're up here together co-presenting. It's really, <clears throat> it's come a long way. So I think the key was for, to get the advocates to, to get the city to change course. Um, so I'm curious, the, the idea of landing, it seems very powerful creating that message and putting a face to what you're doing. Um, with the conversation this morning, I'm honestly curious, like, was there a discussion around making some light? That's a very good question. Uh, one of the challenges, so I've been doing personas with a number of different companies, Apple Computer, Microsoft, Google. So I, there's always a struggle between when you're making a persona, do you make a persona that represents the data you have, or do you make a persona that's aspirational, that's for the market you want? And that's always a push and pull. And in order for the persona to be believable, I've erred usually on the side of representing the data accurately. So, um, you know, for our city, um, we just happen to have, it just fits the demographics. Um, it wasn't uh, a conscious decision, per se, to make her white. It's just that, you know, the people that we had in the community and the people that I could get photos of and stuff, it just worked out that way and we haven't changed it. Um, it would be you know, certainly open to changing that image in the future. Um, you know, when we do a, a photo shoot, it would be definitely better to have something which is a bit more um, inclusive of a look for that. So I had, I was very fortunate to have three interns from the University of Washington um, for the entire summer. So we audited two greenways per week. We audited every greenway in the network. Oh, we have 14 neighborhood greenways. And they range from two blocks to over four miles. So there's quite a range. But we actually, it was very labor intensive. So four person, you know, four people for three months working full time on this. We have a lot of data, um, and hopefully the model that we've built with SDOT will be very helpful in improving the network in the future and making sure that none of the issues that we've observed fall through the cracks.
And uh, we were anticipating that question, Jen, but um, uh, they're sitting uh, in my inbox, actually, for <laughs> their final review. And then, uh, then they'll be going through a bit of an approval process. And, um, and then we will probably start by putting this, uh, this PowerPoint online on our website. But shoot me an email and, uh, in about a month, I'd say. <laughs> Let's shoot Mike an email. Uh, great job on the AAA of the actual facilities, but do you have a AAA distance between facilities or uh, aspirational goal for residential proximity to AAA facilities? Mm -hmm. Everybody up here likes that question, but they're thinking about it. <laughs> I have a little bit of an answer. Uh, we don't uh, have, a, have a guideline at this point, but um, for those who know our network, we already we we have a bikeway on a local street outside the downtown. This is uh, we have a bikeway on a local street between almost every arterial, and that that was our goal back uh, in our 1999 bike plan was to effectively replicate the the arterial network with local local bikeways, and uh, our network is currently at that. At that stage, there are a few gaps, but um, but ideally, we would have a, uh, a, 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 a one between each arterial. Uh, we have actually talked about densifying that closer to the downtown, so that we can bring you know there are more opportunities to get into the downtown for commuting purposes in, in particular. So having two routes in between uh, each arterial, and that uh, our spacing is half a mile for arterials probably similar to many American cities, but uh, um, so uh, that would be a, a, a bikeway every 400 meters or so if we, if we doubled that. So I'm not saying, it's not set in stone, but those are the numbers we've kind of batted around. And we do have some actually where there are two, two bikeways between the arterials uh, south of downtown, so. Are there anybody outside of government who maybe like to take a shot at that first? A uh, non engineer? So I can answer that. <laughs> 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 so we have equity goals in our filter when we uh, build our facility. Um, uh, there's uh, resources for education and outreach, and, and there's also uh, a component to uh, reach out to the underserved communities. And so a lot of our communities that are uh, in South, Southeast Seattle, we know that they, they're not in the city like this. So the, some of the communities, uh, you know, they are. are favorite engineer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, uh, we are definitely over the time. I, uh, I'm hoping that maybe uh, folks will stay around for a few more minutes if we didn't get to your question. Maybe you can come up and you know, grab somebody and ask a question.